You're listening to the Lifehouse Fellowship Podcast. Wherever you're listening today, we pray that this message is encouraging, it's empowering, and it equips you to change your world. I, I've been, I'm not going to keep you long, but I do need to get this out. Go to Daniel chapter 9. Can I have my phone, babe? Thank you. Can y'all listen fast? Thank you for that. I'm still on the church under fire. I want to talk specifically today about the importance of why we're going through what we're going through. Why why do you think culture is so anti-God right now? So anti-surrender. If it feels good, do it. If you want to live with a in the homosexual lifestyle, just do it. If you want to change your gender, just just do it. Why are we seeing it so prevalent right now? Because there is a spirit of this age that has to come to try to undermine the spirit of the local church. Three of you said amen. You're not going to like what I have to say if if you're a woke person today. If you think wokeness is the 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 I'm I'm on a mission. If you think wokeness is the newness of the nation, you have bought a lie. Now I say this with all love and I say this with all grace, but there is an urgency on the inside of me as a pastor and as a leader to teach the local church. Now we have global alliance of pastors. We are on our Philippines call. We've got about 20 pastors on this call on Thursday night. At Thursday night at at, uh, 10 o'clock, I'm wrapping up my call, and I go to pray, and immediately the Holy Ghost arrests me. As I close my eyes, I see a guy hanging from a noose, from from a rope. It was the weirdest. I haven't had that. I don't know if I've ever been in this place where I've ever seen that before. I couldn't make out, it was like a water picture, it was like a watercolor. And I could see this yellow rope and this guy hanging off to the side. And I come against the spirit of suicide. And the Lord says, no, it's the spirit of martyrdom. That many will die for their faith. I was like, okay, Lord, I get it. But what does that have to do with anything? Well, the Philippines, they're right next to China. China is a communistic country, and they are coming after the church, mainly Christians. You know, one of the fastest growing churches is in China, the church underground. They had to go underground for a reason. One of the fastest growing churches is in the church uh, 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 in, in, in Iran. A million converts. Matter of fact, they're shutting down mosques. And people are receiving and having visions of Jesus returning. And, these, and, and they're having to shut down mosques because people are getting a revelation of who Jesus is. 
And I just been hearing the Lord say, get the church ready. What we're going through, what, what is happening also in our nation, ha- happening in our economy, ha- are the effects of a nation who has said, we don't need God. We've taken God out of school systems. We've taken prayer. We've taken all these things out of our school systems. And I'm going to tell you right now, there no person, no man's going to be able to fix it. Only God can fix what this nation needs. Thank you. So my point in today's message is, there's a reason why we've been feeling the fire. There's a reason why we've been feeling the pressure and the enemy's ramping up his attacks. I woke, so Sunday night, I was in prayer. I couldn't go to sleep. I went to my office and I began to pray over this church. I began to, began to pray over this partners. And the Lord said to me, uh, document, document, document. And, and so there's just things that we're doing internally that the Lord told us to do. And then he said, ramp up your general liability on the church with insurance. That's, I'm, you know, I'm just talking. I was like, okay. God doesn't talk to me like that. And the reason why we have to understand the season we're in is because the enemy would love nothing than to shut you down. The enemy would would love for you to throw in the towel and say, enough is enough. I'm done. The enemy would love for you to say, just keep doing what you're doing and have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. The enemy would love for you to sit in a cold, dry, dead church. I got anybody's attention yet? Attention yet? Creation. Now, when I get over here, one of my favorite things to study study is eschatology. I love trying to figure out when Jesus is going to return. My youth pastor would tell me all the time, I'll tell you when Jesus is going to return. We'd all be like, when? The hour you think not. We'd be like, Albert. (laughs) He was awesome. But you you do need to know that you are under pressure for a reason. There's a reason why the enemy does not like it when the Spirit of God shows up. And just like last week, when we begin to shout, and then uh, uh, Miss Candace saw that, that things were shaking, and then, uh, then demons were running in, as in, in, in terror, and the, 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 he- the heavenly realms begin to get behind our shout. That, that's just not a good story. That's something that's taken place because the people know who their God is. Now, from creation to the church age, Roughly 4,004 years 
plus 33. When Jesus died, grace began. And the law ended. All at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, there's about 437 years, 4,037 years. Turn over to Daniel chapter 9. Several books out there that you need to read. I'll tell them to you here in a minute. God's plan for man. I was supposed to bring them, but forgot them. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. All up to this point, to uh, 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 we'll start in verse 20. All up to verse 20 is a prayer that Daniel prays. After the prayer, God responds to Daniel. Okay? How many of you know when you pray, there should be a response? Amen? How many of y'all believe when you pray that Jesus hears you? Not sometimes, not part of the time, every time. Jesus hears you when you pray. And this is God's response back to Daniel after he prayed from Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, all the way to 20. God responds, verse 20. Now, while I was speaking, this is Daniel, and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of the people of Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, <clears throat> Then man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering and informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Understanding. I love it. <clears throat> skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you. For you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand this vision. When you began to pray, I was commanded to come. Hmm. When you pray, heaven responds. When you pray, heaven responds. Now, I, that's just a little side journey, side note. Things happen when you pray. Daniel prays and asks for forgiveness. Daniel, being a good man, and he's repenting not only for himself, but he's repenting also for, him, uh, for the nation. Man, church... You know, moms and dads, if you'll come up here and, and do your thing, with do business with the Lord, the Lord will begin to heal some stuff. You got to lay down your pride. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined. 70. I want you to put that. I want to put 70 weeks are determined. For your people and for your holy city to, to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the beginning, from going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks 
and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And after sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end of it shall be with the flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he who shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And in, on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now set all that to bring you to this point. We read all that to bring you to this point. God has times and structures set into place. God is a not God is not a God of Kesara Sarah, whatever will be will be. God is a God of time, precision, and appointment. God is a God of time, precision, and appointment. What we have to do is get in God's time. We have to understand, like the sons of Issachar did, they understood the seasons and the time. See, God's not going, huh, this sounds like a good day to bless Jose. No, he set some for some things in the blessing of, of, of being this of being a sower of the seed, seed, time, harvest. He's walking in harvest because of what he did with his seed. It isn't just like, well, we'll see. Maybe. You sowed some seeds, there was some time and a harvest. So God's a God of time, precision, and appointment. It's not just throw up some puzzle pieces and see if they all land right. It's not how God works. So when it comes to the church age, and this is, this is very important that you understand that there's precision. The reason why we're feeling the growing pains. There's a reason why the earth is groaning. Because we are about to see the king. That's why what we do in this church matters. Because there's people out there that need a revelation of God's love. Now bring you to this point. 1948, does anybody know what happened in 1948? Israel became a nation. And the Lord said, based off Daniel's 70th week and how he said it right here, I shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. In it. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring it into sacrifice and offering. The end shall be with a flood. Does anybody know what that was? How about Noah? Till the end of the war and desolations are determined. What's Israel been doing ever since day one? They've been fighting for their land. From here to where we're at now, we are at 6,000. And 28. Why is that important? 
There's a great book called End Time Events by Charles Capps. Charles Capps talks about a parenthetical period of time. Right at 6,000 is when God said the earth least has expired and we're in a period of time before the return of Jesus. What happens for the next thousand years? There's going to be the millennial reign of Christ. When Jesus returns, we're going to rule with him for a thousand years. Now, I I bring all this together because I'm trying to get you to understand and see how important the church is today. Scripture says, let me get get my stuff together here. Daniel's 70th week, the rapture and the millennial reign of Christ are very important to outline. 6,028 years from creation to 2,024. It's essential to understand these calculations and historical interpretations. Creation, 4,004. Giving of the law was at 1446. The crucifixion of Christ at AD 30 to the present day, 2024. When you understand where we're at on God's timetable, May 14th, 1948, Israel was established. According to Ezekiel 37, 21, and 22, according to Isaiah 66, verse 8, can a nation be born in a day? Yes. According to Matthew chapter 24, 32 through 34, let's look at that right quick. I just want to, uh, (laughs) I know this is a lot of information, but with the time I've got, I'm just trying to hit it hard. 32 through 34. Now then this parable from the fig tree, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know the summer is near. So you also, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Uh, Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. When Israel is formed, that generation will see the return of Jesus. Now, it's said to be a generation, 70 to 80 years. I'm not trying to tell you when Jesus is coming. All I'm saying is you better get ready. I'm not pinpointing a date, nor am I trying to pinpoint a year. All I'm trying to get you to understand is why there's an importance in what we're called to do as a church. We should not think it strange when we understand that, you know, people leave Google reviews that aren't positive. We shouldn't think it's strange when we enter into the fiery trial. We shouldn't think it's strange when the enemy comes in like a flood. All we need to know is that the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against it. All we need to know is that when God is for us, no man can be against us. All we need to know that Jesus will reign again in our lives, in this church, and in the whole entire world. That's all we need to know. I set all that up to get you to understand the importance of the local church. 
Do you know, we did a, these uh, Global Alliance of Pastors calls. They said, well, well why, why are you going after pastors? And I said, the reason I'm going after a pastor is because when you got a strong pastor, you have a strong congregation. A strong congregation can affect and make a difference in a community. So we're going after pastors. We're going after their hearts. We're going out to encourage them, to let them know they're not alone, to say, you know what, we're for you, and if God be for you, who could be against you? Let's go get those people in your community, amen? Now, I set all that up to bring us to this place. The church is in a pivotal moment. Facing both external challenges and internal struggles. The spirit of religion is subtle, but it's a powerful force that can infiltrate and weaken the body of Christ. We will hit the spirit of religion right between the eyeballs. We're not going to put up with religion around here. The spirit of religion, though, has many faces. And one of the faces we have to, we have to, uh, we have to call out is the face called legalism. Matthew 23, 23 and 24, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for focusing on minor details of the law while, while neglecting justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Charles Stanley said this, and I love Charles Stanley. He said, the Christian life is not about rules, but it's about relationship with the living God. Legalism blinds believers to the heart of the gospel, leading them away from grace and mercy. Legalism says you got to do more. Legalism says you got to do this, 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 this in order to receive that, that, and that. Well, the last time I read my Bible, he said, all who call on the name of Jesus shall be saved. You come unto me, all you weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. The last time I read my Bible, all I had to do is confess the Lord Jesus as my Savior, turn from my wicked ways, start seeking his face, and oh, it's a good day for me. It's not about more legalism. You know, I have to really deal with this in the in the in, uh, uh, it, when I'm when I'm talking to my Catholic friends. I have to deal with this when I'm talking to my my pastors in Kenya because it's law, 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 rules, regulations, restrictions, and restraints which equals rebellion. But I'm telling you, Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. I've come to give you freedom. I've come to give you hope. I've come to give you strength. I've come to give you my life, the Zoe kind of life, the God kind of living. See, legalism keeps people bound. Can I tell you another face that we're going to have to address when it comes to the spirit of religion is the spirit of ritualism. Rituals. Can I just give you a little definition? Prioritizing form over faith.
I didn't have my hands high enough. I didn't kneel long enough. I didn't cry hard enough. I didn't pray long enough. You see what I'm saying? Form over faith. Rituals. Rituals, rituals. I'm coming against the spirit of ritualism. Rituals. You know, these guys that score touchdowns and they do their, or they get up and they kiss the rosary, you know. I mean, if that's what you want to do, get after it. But I'm talking about having a relationship with Jesus and not have a form of godliness. Form over faith, I'll take faith. We're not condemning people for doing these things. All we're saying is there's a better way. Isaiah 1 13 through 15 says this, God rejects empty rituals when they are disconnected from genuine devotion. God rejects empty rituals when they are disconnected from genuine devotion. Rituals are dangerous when they become routine without meaning. Did you hear that? Rituals are dangerous when they become routine without meaning. Well, this is this is what I do. I get up, I go to my office, I turn on, I say, Alexa, today's daily devotional. Now playing today's daily devotional. You are in August. You are September one, two thousand and twenty-four. Today's reading is da da da, and you just go through the motions. I've got notes and notes and notes. Can I tell on myself? I've got notes and notes and notes. A lot of form, a lot of religion, but no relationship. Le- legalism and ritualism become idols when they replace an intimate relationship with God. Some of you need to write that down. Ritualism becomes an idol when it replaces relationship with God. We know the Ten Commandments to be, God said, I'll have no other idols before me. But can your rituals become an idol? Sure they can. Why? Because it's just going through the motions with no heart connection. Here's the third face. You ready? Judgmentalism. Boy, this is a good one. Condemning others without self reflection. <laughs> Condemning others without having self-reflection, without looking at yourself in the mirror and say, Sutton, get it together, man. What are you doing? But I'll I'll go and I'll just talk about so-and-so and and all, oh, Lord, do you see what they did? What about you? When you got that finger pointed that way, they always said four fingers are pointed back, but I've always thought there was three. 
We look out here and we refuse to deal with this. You can't judge others when you are so busy examining yourself. Rick Ward said that. You can't judge others when you're busy about, God, reprove me. Judge me. Deal with me. Get rid of anything that's not of you. Come on, somebody. Give the Lord praise in this house. Matthew 7, 1 through 5 suggests that Jesus warns against hypocrisy in judging others without first examining yourself. Judgmental attitudes divide the church and hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, God has put leadership in this house and they've been approved Stamped by God. And if you come against them, you're coming against me. I approve of you. I want everybody to hear it. I'm proud of you too. If you come against them, you might as well just talk about Tanya and I. Furthermore, if they talk about you, they might as well have talked about me. Judge yourself. I say it with all love today because Jesus is coming back for a bride. That's without spot or wrinkle. We have to judge ourselves. If we don't judge ourselves, we lead ourselves into a place of deception. And I refused to live in deception. The move of God actively strives for renewal even as the enemy attempts to undermine his work within the local church. You say, you see, we've been praying for a revival around here. We've been praying that God would send forth laborers. We've been praying that he would send us the, the lost and the hurting. We've been praying that they would come from the north, the south, the east, and the west, that you they would come into this place, fill this place. But let me tell you, if we have a form of godliness but deny God's power, they'll go another way. We have to pursue the things of God. We have to reject ritualism. We have to reject legalism. We have to reject, reject judgmentalism. Let me tell you, there are going to be people that come into this house that we're going to have to close our eyes and serve Jesus. Some of you are going to have to just close your eyes by faith because they ain't going to look like you. I mean, you're going to have to hold your nose by faith because they ain't going to smell like you either. I'm talking about the church under fire. There's a reason why God has sent his fire to Lifehouse Fellowship Church. It's to purify us as his people. I'm a short. I brought all this up because I love it. But it's to tell you that time is short. Young person, you don't have time to play around. Yeah, 
even us middle agers. <laughs> even us time is short get it together get it together Ladies and gentlemen, it's just a message of urgency is all it is. Just a message that one of these days, and I believe very soon, that the Father's going to reach over and touch Jesus on the shoulder. Because Jesus don't even know the time or the hour. But the father's going to reach over and touch Jesus on the shoulder. And he's going to say, go get my bride. You know this generational thing here? You know where we're at? We're at 76. The generation that won't see death before the return of Jesus. Now, that could be a bunch of fooey. I graduated Plainview High, Deja. My math, you know, I try to do my best. But I believe every day we're closer to Jesus' return. And it's not just pie in the sky. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't know. But can he find us in pursuit? Leaving out judgmentalism, legalism, and ritualism. But find us with pure hearts, seeking and looking for his glorious appearing. There's a reason why the church is under fire. Because the enemy wants to undermine your faith. If he can undermine your faith, then he's done his job. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The culture is shouting, throw in the towel, give up, give in. But I want you to know as your friend and as your pastor, I'm shouting louder, don't give up, don't give in, stay the course. If you need to repent, repent. If you need to get right with Jesus, get right with Jesus. Many times it's not the huge 180 turns, it's the little tweaks in life that help us on our journey. 
Can you make the adjustment? Because last week I talked about church number eight. What will this church be known for? What will you be known for? And all the churches, Jesus ended them, but he also said, somewhere you will first love. Somewhere you came up against my love and direction for your life. And all I need for you is to return back. It's as simple as that. If you're here today, I'm not here to try to scare you out of hell. I'm not here to try to scare you into heaven. That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job is to convict. But maybe you're convicted because you're like, oh, I haven't been living right. It's as simple as saying today, Lord, forgive me. That's it. Forgive me. Some of you, the spirit of unbelief is tried to grip you. Is this stuff even real? And the Lord says today, believe on me. You're here today and that's you. Would you just stand up right where you are? I'm not going to ask you to come down. Thank you for that, sir. Just stand up right where you're at. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody's looking around. Anybody else? We're all going to pray this prayer together because we're the church. And when one hurts, we all hurt. Say this with me. Father, I come to you. I've missed it. I have fallen short. I'm asking for mercy today. I'm asking for you to return back to me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I love you. I confess you as my Savior, as my King. Today I surrender. I give you my life. Help me to develop a relationship with you. Thank you for receiving me. Thank you for writing my name in the Lamb's book of life. I love you. We all say an amen. Just right where you're at, just raise your hands. Just tell him thank you. All the angels are rejoicing because you made a decision for the king today. Family, you see them standing up. Would you just begin to surround them right now and just let them know that they're a part of the body of Christ? Just pray for them.
Father, we bless them now in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for the encounter of your love. May they never be the same again. Jesus' name. I come against the spirit of depression now. I break it off of their lives. I come against the spirit of defeat. It's broken off you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You have been born into newness of life. I pray that you begin to see differently, hear clearly, and love deeply. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's all stand to our feet. Let's just give the Lord praise in this house. Begin to just tell him how good he is. Come on, we can do better than that. <laughs> Come on, let's rejoice. Five people gave their hearts to Jesus today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those of you that rededicated your lives, got born again today, we welcome you into the kingdom. We're grateful and we're thankful that the Lord brought you to us today. Don't walk alone. We'll love you. Get committed in church. Let's grow in our process. Let's grow in our discipleship. We have kingdom school around here. Man, that, I, yeah, come on. It's a great way to grow in your love for the Lord by understanding his heart. I want to encourage you to get involved and be a part of that. Whatever you do, know you're not alone. As a church, we'll love you. We'll help you on your journey. Father God, today, as I close this message and the urgency that you put on my heart, even this week, to just try to give people an understanding of where we're at on your timetable. Lord, we know that prayer can hold the thing back. But we also know that you love your people so much. And we want to be the glorious bride. Help us, Lord, this week to reflect on your goodness. Help us this week to reflect on your love for each and every one of us. And Father God, we can't judge others when we're busy about judging ourselves. Help us to judge ourselves. When we miss it, Holy Ghost, would you let us know? <laughs> Holy Spirit, would you just convict us and may we be quick to repent and say, Lord, I apologize. Forgive me. Lord, I bless the people today. I pray, Father God, that their rest is sweet because you give your beloved rest. I pray over the next week, Father God, for divine encounters with you. Dreams, visions, we receive them and we're ready for you to speak. And we all say, amen. God bless you, I love you. Thank you for listening today. Our hope is that this message is an encouragement to you to change your world. Before you go, we want to connect with you. If you have a prayer request, 
you're interested in what we have to offer for our students, or you want to learn more about us, visit us at our website at lifehousefellowship.net. Remember, great days are here and greater days are ahead.